filter feeding almost feels like a modern invention. We don't often think of a ton of extinct life forms that filtered water for their daily bread, and yet they existed. More are being found all the time. There were pterosaurs that did it, extinct birds that did it like they do today, giant whale-like fish that did it, the ancient whales that gave rise to today's whales, and a slew of ancient marine reptiles like the long-necked plesiosaurs and some of the bizarre manatee or turtle-like placodonts. However, a brand new study shows that an entirely different group related to the ichthyosaurs also tried their flippers at filter feeding. Secondarily aquatic tetrapods such as reptiles and mammals provide textbook examples of convergent evolution in feeding and locomotion. Most such convergences are seen in carnivorous hunting modes of life, where Mesozoic marine reptiles, whales, or pinnipeds have become top predators in their ecosystems. Less familiar are examples of massive filter feeders, the role taken today by numerous species of baleen whales and explored by giant late Jurassic pachycormiform fish. In filter feeding, the baleen whales use baleen plates, loosely articulated snout bones, large mouths, and expandable throats, while the pachycormiform fish evolved complex gill arch and enlarged toothless mouths. All these filter adaptations aim to retain small prey items within the oral cavity. It had been suggested, however, that marine reptiles could not be filter feeders because they lack the key features of fish and mammals that enable them to feed in this way, such as the gill slits of fish or the baleen of whales. However, filter feeding has already been suggested in the late Cretaceous plesiosaur Morturneria and the late Triassic Nothosauroid Paludidraco, both based on the configuration of their teeth and oral cavity. Further, some marine reptiles, despite not being regarded as filter feeders, used filtration while processing food, such as the hammer-snouted Otopodentatus unicus and false turtle Hedonus cheliops, both of the Triassic. A brand new study published in August of 2023 by a team of Chinese and British paleontologists in the journal BMC Ecology and Evolution reevaluates the remains of the Chinese marine reptile Hupesuchus as some new specimens have been found and described that preserve their skulls in a new position, allowing for a better understanding of their feeding apparatus. Hupesuchus has been known to science since 1972 from over a handful of specimens from the early Triassic period of Hubei, China. These guys were the first members found of their own family and order of marine reptiles that consequently took their name, the Hupesuchids and Hupesuchia, respectively. Over the following decades, as more close relatives were found or reanalyzed, it turned out that these bizarre marine reptiles were part of the Ichthyosauromorpha group and were cousins to the true ichthyosaurs. When it comes to fossils, you get what you get. If you only find one specimen of a critter and it's preserved in two dimensions, in a specific angle and pose, that's the best look you get at the animal's anatomy. That is, unless the bones are better preserved than they look and you can CT scan them in the computer for further analysis. Assuming this isn't the case, as it wasn't for the first specimens of Hupesuchus found, you get what you get and you base your hypotheses off that. If more specimens are found in different angles or poses, then you must adjust. This is what has just occurred with Hupesuchus. First off, Hupesuchus is extremely bizarre. This isn't a profile video for the entire genus, so I won't go into enormous detail on the animal here. In short though, it had a very tall torso in side view, with huge wide vertebral spines aligned close together to stiffen the body as a whole. Its limbs were modified into rudimentary flippers, its tail was tall and flat for propulsion, and it had a short, thin neck attached to a long, thin skull that sort of looked like you smashed together an ichthyosaur and a platypus. The feeding strategy of this animal has been controversial because its skull was poorly preserved. Hupesuchus was first suggested as a filter feeder in 1991 by researchers Robert L. Carroll and Dong Jiming based on its toothless snout, but this hypothesis was rejected by the 1997 work of Rachel Collin and Christine Janis due to the animal's small, narrow skull and relatively long neck. 
Then, in 2015, Yosuke, Motani, and colleagues published some work on these animals in which they studied the palate and mandible parts of the skull from the single specimen with the skull preserved in ventral view. With this upside-down skull, the team found that Hubeisuchus would most likely have been a filter-feeding animal, similar to pelicans and rorqual whales. This team found that, contrary to the work of Colin and Janice, the long neck and slender skull of Hupesuchus wouldn't have been a problem for filter feeding. To fully resolve the issue and figure out exactly how the animal may have filtered the water for its food, more specimens were needed, ones with skulls in top view. In comes the current team, with two specimens of Hupesuchus with exactly what was needed to solve the mystery. So, there are now enough specimens known to show the skull inside, top, and bottom views. These two new specimens, WGSC V26007 and 2020 NYF844, were collected from the Lower Triassic Member 2 of the Jialingjing Formation of the Lower Triassic in Yanzhang and Yuanan County, Hubei Province. The skeleton of WGSC V26007 is preserved from the skull to the clavicle region, and 2020 NYF844 is a nearly complete skeleton. So, from the top, this is what the skull looks like, sort of similar to the discovery made a few years ago of the skull of Hupesuchus's relative Eretmorhippus. By this, I mean they both seem to have a sort of platypus style upper jaw with a space in between the two halves of the skull. Yes, for those unaware, take the flesh away from a platypus's bill and you get this pincer-shaped thing. Freaky weird, huh? The space in the snout is scientifically referred to as an intercrural space. This intercrural space is long and bordered by the premaxillae and nasal bones. The lower jaw, or mandible, is long and extremely slender, and its anatomy is far more like the jaws of rorquals than the ichthyosaurs. The separate mandibles that loosely articulate with the skull resemble those of modern rorqual whales, which are efficient means to expand a large gular pouch. The bone structures seen in baleen whales that correlate with the presence of that baleen were not found in Hupesuchus, but the jaw margin has a series of oblique parallel shallow groove-like depressions oriented from the middle of the snout to the back. There are several bulges in the same orientation and between the grooves. The new team decided to do some mathematics tests to compare the skulls of Hupesuchus to those of filter-feeding whales, as well as 130 other amniote animal skulls to be more confident in a filter-feeding hypothesis. To do this, they used a technique called geometric morphometrics. They placed nine landmarks in the skull roof that described the basic outline of the skull roof, as well as the relative length and intermediate space of the rostrum or snout. These landscapes basically give the researchers, and more importantly the software they place all this into, an idea of the general morphology or anatomy of the skull as a whole, as well as some specific bones within the skull. The skulls to which it is most like may be the feeding strategy it was most likely to have had. On these graphs, the computer plotted all of the landmarks of all of the skulls used. The x-axis, PC1, reflects changes in relative length of the snout, while the y-axis, PC2, highlights differences in maximal width of the skull. Odontocetes, the toothed whales, occupy the largest region and overlap with other groups, reflecting their high species richness and functional diversity. The second most dispersed group, the birds, nearly all have positive PC2 scores, but divide into two parts along the PC1 axis with negative and positive scores. The mysticetes, or baleen whales, nearly all have negative PC2 scores overlapping part of the region of odontocetes exclusively. The crocodilians and pinnipeds show high levels of overlap, located in negative PC1 regions, except for Paleosuchus palpibrosus and Omatophoca rossii. The morphospace of the last three groups is relatively restricted, reflecting the specialization of these groups. Birds, odontocetes, and crocodilians slash pinnipeds all occupy non-overlapping areas. The point for Hubesuchus is located in the morphospace where the mysticetes overlap the odontocetes, indicating that its skull shape is similar to that of modern whales. Hubesuchus shares the elongated snout and nasal bones placed near the back of the skull with whales. In addition, the intercrural space in its palate is similar to the mesorostral groove in cetaceans, separating the premaxillae. 
the skull of Hupaisuchus is more similar to that of Mysticetes than Odontocetes. In the elongated separated rostrum, the toothless snout, and concave brain case in the midline. Differing from this, odontocetes have more posterior migration of the nostrils, development of a more rounded brain case, and increasing facial asymmetry. To further prove their point, the team compiled prey size classes of all the predators they used in the skull analysis and came up with their own schema. Tiny, small, middle, and large. Critters in the tiny class specially feed on zooplankton or fishes that are smaller than them. Predators regarded as feeding on small class prey consume items ranging from zooplanktons or benthic invertebrates to small fish and squid, whereas those in the middle class are usually fish and squid specialists. The large class represents apex predators that prey on tetrapods. This resulted in the second graph right here. The convergent evolution of the skulls of Hupesuchus and baleen whales is also matched in this analysis. Almost all mysticetes prey on tiny-sized zooplankton, whereas odontocetes, pinnipeds, and birds prey on small to medium-sized invertebrates, squids, and fish. Odontocetes and crocodilians select prey over a wide size range, from small fish to large tetrapods, some reaching apex predatory niches such as Orsinus orca and Crocodilus porosus. In the prey size morphospace, Hupesuchus is located in the region overlapped by tiny and middle sized predators, which corresponds to its toothless snout, slender jaw, and living in an environment lacking fish and crustaceans. So, both analyses are kind of the clinchers here. Besides expanding a throat pouch through flexible and elongated jaws, Hupesuchus increased the intercrural space in the snout to widen and enlarge the mouth cavity to adapt to filter feeding. Filter feeding tetrapods require a large mouth to make predation efficient. In the evolution of mysticetes, a wider and looser rostrum is a critical adaptation for filter feeding, which occurred before the existence of baleen. Baleen whales evolved longer snouts and bigger skulls in comparison to their bodies, which is related to their need to develop a large mouth cavity to perform filter feeding. Similarly, the filter-feeding Cretaceous plesiosaur Mortarneria had a deeply arched palate with a midline keel to increase mouth cavity volume, convergent with baleen whales, and similar to the specific adaptations of the gray whales. The intercrural space in Hupesuchus is comparable with a similar structure in Aretmorhippus, a Hupesuchian with small eyes, which might have been a predator that used non-visual senses, hence why its snout was a lot more platypus-like than Hupesuchus. Further, Retmorhippus was a slow maneuvering swimmer with a rigid body and tail coupled with large fan shaped propulsive flippers. Hupesuchus had larger eyes and a slenderer snout than Retmorhippus. The anatomy of both taxa suggests that Hupesuchus was a better swimmer than Retmorhippus, which would imply different feeding strategies. Some other Mesozoic marine reptiles show a similar space in the midline of the snout, but this might have had a variety of functions. The Middle Triassic Autopodentatus, with its pronounced hammerhead-shaped skull, has a paired, separated premaxillae with a slender, rhombus-shaped space. Its heterodont teeth, the chisel-shaped teeth in the straight anterior edge of the jaws, and the needle-shaped jaw ramus suggest that this unusual marine reptile was a seaweed grazer, the oldest record of herbivory in a marine reptile. The toothless late Triassic ichthyosaur Shastasaurus liangae shows a very large internasal hole in the skull roof. The feeding mode of this ichthyosaur has been debated. Perhaps it was a suction feeder based on its short toothless snout, or perhaps the slender hyobranchial bone excludes the affinity with suction feeding, suggesting it was a ram feeder. Further, in the early Jurassic ichthyosaurs, Ichthyosaurus communis and Leptonectus tenirostris, the hole in the skull roof midline moves posteriorly to the internasal and interfrontal region. Baleen is made from keratin, forming a soft and tough fibrous curtain dangling from the upper jaw in baleen whales, and used to filter engulfed water in the mouth and trap prey. The origin of baleen and stem mysticetes is contentious and researchers suggest several interpretations of the transition from raptorial feeding with teeth as in stem mysticetes to baleen-assisted filter feeding as in modern mysticetes.
However, the best explanation supported by current evidence on this transition is that the stem mysticetes passed through an intermediate stage with both teeth and baleen before a complete loss of their teeth and becoming modern filter feeders with baleen. In Hubeisuchus, the grooves and bulges around the lip margins are reminiscent of the lateral palate holes in mysticetes, suggesting the existence of soft tissues like baleen during the whole feeding process, and these presumably played an important role in filter feeding. In life, these grooves may have borne soft tissues for filter feeding, which replaced the position of the tooth sockets, similar to gray whales. Although the research team could not identify soft tissues in the fossils themselves, these uneven structures would have been useful to strain the water expelled from the mouth cavity, completing the filtration. Therefore, they argue that the cranial structure of Hupesuchus is convergent with modern baleen whales on the basis of three bullet points. The intercrural space in the snout, the slender and unfused lower jaws, and the grooves left by soft tissues around the palatal margins. Perhaps the diet of Hupesuchus resembled that of modern mysticetes, which depend on the supply of zooplankton such as shrimp-like arthropods. There were plenty of zooplankton around at the time for these reptiles to sift through. Although the modern baleen whales are all large filter feeders, they feed quite differently in terms of strategy and food preference. The Balenopterid whales, also known as warquels, employ a lunge filter feeding style in which they swim rapidly at a prey patch while opening their mouth to gulp the mixture of water and prey, then filter the water through the baleen plates and swallow the retained prey. Probably the biggest mass murdering predators on the planet aside from us. Rorquil whales have specialized anatomy and feeding performance to support their lunge feeding strategy to capture fish, shoals, and plankton. The balenid whales, including bowhead and right whales, employ a skim filter feeding style in which they capture plankton from the water by swimming slowly with their mouth open. In another filtering mode, the gray whale feeds mainly on benthic invertebrates that it ingests by swimming along the seabed on one side, using lateral suction feeding to take in sediment plus prey. If we take our attention back to the 2015 work of Ryosuke Motani and colleagues, we will find that they suggested Hupesuchus was a lunge feeder like pelicans or workwolves. This interpretation was based mainly on its slender and flexible jaw and its palatal structure which probably supported soft tissues as strainer. The skull structure in the 2023 study reveals that Hupesuchus is more like baleen whales than pelicans and employed filter feeding. Considering its paddle-like limbs and the tall neural spines along the back, Hupesuchus was thought to have advantages for acceleration and maneuvering, as in intermittent lunge filter feeders like Rorquals. But the rigid trunk without space between the neural spines and three layers of interlinked bony armor along the back limited the beastie's movements. It couldn't swish its body from side to side like what early ichthyosaurs could do. The internally thick ribs in Hupesuchus indicate a need for buoyancy control in these critters and reflects a more shallow water existence. Thus, Hupesuchus would have most likely employed continuous ram filter feeding, as in bowhead and right whales, rather than lunge filter feeding, as in rorqual whales. Another thing pointing to a filter feeding ecology for this critter is that the region seemed to be generally devoid of fish. The tongue and throat bones, known as the hyoids, are not strong enough to support suction feeding, as in gray whales. Hupesuchus would have continuously filter fed at slow swimming speeds from dense patches of plankton at the surface or shallow water column. The jaw, with a well-developed retroarticular process, and snout bones that accommodate the intercrural space improve the functional advantage of the volume of the oral cavity, which is efficient for filter feeding. Hupesuchians and mysticetes specialize in a filter feeding strategy, but there is a major difference in the speed with which this unusual feeding mode evolved in the two groups. Whereas whales evolved 15 million years after the end Cretaceous mass extinction and filter feed adaptations in mysticetes long after that, around 34 million years ago, marine reptiles diversified extraordinarily fast in the early and middle Triassic acquiring a broad array of adaptations within as little as 5 million years. 
Despite this, the diversity of feeding yields of Triassic marine ecosystems is comparable to that in the modern marine environment. The skull anatomy of Mesozoic marine reptiles reflects their feeding modes and is usually divided into short and long snouts. Short-snouted marine reptiles included suction feeders, which created sub-ambient pressure in the mouth to capture prey, such as most Eosauropterygians and Thalatosaurs. Long-snouted marine reptiles, including almost all ichthyosaurs, are generally regarded as ram feeders whose acceleration and movement are used in prey capture. This early Triassic diversity is now added to with filter-feeding Hupesuchians. Secondary aquatic adaptation by Mesozoic reptiles and Cenozoic mammals provides many classic examples of convergent evolution, explained as adaptations to similar ecological niches. Constraints on locomotion in the aquatic environment may have enhanced the repeated convergences in body plan. Many marine reptiles and mammals evolved streamlined bodies and efficient lift-based swimming, especially using propulsion from the dorsal fin in ichthyosaurs and modern dolphins. Further, skull and tooth anatomy can reflect ecological convergence related to food resources, feeding strategies, and prey levels. Driven by filtering adaptations, Hupesuchus and baleen whales share convergences which are concentrated in their skull anatomy, such as the toothless snout, the divided upper jaw, and the lower jaw with a pronounced retroarticular process. Hupesuchus lived in the early Triassic, and it was part of the rapid biotic recovery of complex marine ecosystems after the end Permian mass extinction. The region in which it occurs is characterized by its restrictive lagoonal paleoenvironment, high reptile diversity, and absence of fish and invertebrates. Perhaps Hupesuchus showed innovative skull anatomy to adapt to filter feeding, and as a result of competition from other predatory marine reptiles, such as ichthyosaurs and eosauropterygians, and as a means to benefit from a food source that was not otherwise fully exploited. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.